Today we're going to continue our study of the book of Acts. Uh, the way this is working so far, uh, we will be in Acts until probably around September of next year. Um, and so um, we'll be in there till next year and uh, around September of next year we'll, be, we'll, we'll have it completed. But our study of the book of Acts has been a very interesting one. There is much drama in this book. Many things have happened. Um, we've seen the Christians be persecuted, um, which will continue, but it, 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 but it comes in different ways, uh, manifests itself in different ways. Uh, we've seen the struggles of just doing ministry. Uh, you know, when, you, when the church was given birth and, and the church began and the word of God began to be preached by Peter and others uh, and the church was growing, which was great. It was wonderful. But as the church grew, situations arose, uh, besides not counting the persecution, just situations from within. Um, there were those who were not uh, being ministered to accordingly, and so the church had to make sure that things got done properly. And so we learned about that in Acts chapter 6. And then, you know, God raised up different men and individuals to preach, men like Stephen and others, and and, as, and because, because of their, their zeal and their, uh, their God-giving abilities, you know, it, was, it clearly became evident that not everyone was going to believe their message or even like their message. Preaching the gospel is not easy. Living for Christ is not easy. You know, even, even here in the Philippines, it's a, it's, it's a very religious country. There are many countries, even in Asia, where it's, it's, it's mostly secular. And I was told some time ago, about a year ago, that if you go to Korea, South Korea, and if you examine the population, everybody, only 5% of the population that are 30 and younger attend any kind of church. That if you go to a church, most likely the predominant population in those churches is 30 and above. Many gray hairs. And thankfully, we do live in a country that allows for religious freedom, religious liberty. We can come here to a jolly bee and have church service. I don't think any McDonald's in America would allow a church to come in. Even if, I don't know, maybe they would, but I, I've never heard of it. I remember when we first started Life Field, and we, and it was, you know, we said that we were going to meet at McDonald's. I'm like, for real? You know, we're actually going to do that? And um, they're going to let us do that? And no rent? I mean, yeah, we got to buy the food, but, you know, we have freedom to preach the gospel. And, and that's a great thing. And while we have that freedom, because that could be taken away someday, you never know. It could all change. But while we have that, it's, it, we need to make sure we make most of those opportunities. And as, and as the church was given birth and as it began in the book of Acts, and, and, and the Holy Spirit came and indwelt the believers, and the gospel became, was proclaimed, and God was saving people and adding them to the number of Christians. And the church was growing. And this is a great thing. You know, the church grew in those days under not religious freedom. You know, not having that freedom to do what we have to do or that we're allowed to do. But God still worked. God still worked and he will always work. And as we go through the book of Acts, you're going to see many different things. You're going to read about different kinds of people. You're going to get introduced to how the gospel now goes beyond the realm of just Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. And we're going to get to the place where we're, we're seeing how the gospel impacts Gentiles. People who are not even Jewish by birth, Jewish by heritage, who didn't grow up in the Jewish religion. Who came up out of a different system, some pagan system that worshipped a God that doesn't really exist. 
And you're going to see how the gospel impacts that culture and, and that, those people and how people's lives are changed because the common problem with everyone throughout the world is sin in the human heart. And there's only one solution to that, and that's the gospel. And we know that. At this point in time in our study in the book of Acts, we had seen the apostle Paul, or he was Saul at that time, how he was basically the leader of the persecution against Christians. I mean, he wanted to kill them. I mean, he was after them, after their, their head. He would be willing to kill man, woman, and child if he had to. He had no convictions or no conscience about killing Christians. In his mind, they had sold out. They had basically sold their soul to the devil. And, it, and, the, and the best thing for them would be to end their life. So he, he received the authority that he needed, and he was on his way to do that. But as we've seen in the early part of chapter 9, God stopped all of that. I mean, literally, that was a confrontation. That was a very dramatic confrontation. I mean, he was blinded and, and, and learned and how God dealt with him and revealed himself to him. I mean, personally, Jesus revealed himself to him. He said, why are you going against me? And, and what you have in the early part of Acts 9 is a conversion experience. Now, not to say that your experience has to be the same as the Apostle Paul. You know, you're not on your way to Damascus to kill somebody, hopefully. There is no Damascus in the Philippines, as far as I know, where we could even go. But you, you, your experience won't be the exact same, but conversion is conversion. The heart is transformed, and it's because of the power of the message of the gospel under the authority and working of, the, of God through the power of the Holy Spirit that changes the heart, that converts the soul. Because we all live in sin. We're all entrapped by sin. And there's no way out except by the death and resurrection of Christ and Him saving us, convicting us. And as we know, salvation is not a human work. So now the Apostle Paul is born again. And God revealed to him that he was going to have a ministry to Gentiles. And most of the book of Acts is going to be about Paul's ministry. Paul will take journeys around Asia Minor, the Asia area, Israel, and even the lands of Greece. He'll even go to Rome. And, there, and, and you're going to see his travels and how he's sent out and how he goes from place to place. And sometimes he, he establishes a church. He's like a missionary, church planner, pastor, shepherd. I mean, he does it all. And you'll see how God the power of the Holy Spirit works through him to accomplish the ministry that Jesus began. Just as, as, as the Holy Spirit works through Peter, works through others to see the gospel proclaimed. And as you go through the book of Acts, you really see this, the whole theme of the book of Acts come to light. And that is that what Jesus told the, the, the disciples Greater works than these that you'll do. What he meant by it was greater in number. And uh, it doesn't mean you have more power than Jesus, okay? It just means greater in number. And the gospel has gone throughout the world. In most places. There's, there's still some unreached groups, but the gospel has, has gone throughout the whole world. It's because God is overseeing that. And so the book of Acts is a very interesting book. It teaches us many things. It teaches us that, that God does work, that God is sovereign, that he will do his ministry. That we don't have to worry about the future. We don't have to worry um, about what happens tomorrow. When you see the book of Acts, you see people responding to the leading of God. And so you don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be distraught. You don't have to 
be sad. Because God will work through you to accomplish His will in your life. And when it's time for you to go to be with Him, He'll bring you home to heaven. And we see that sovereignty of God throughout the book, and it should bring us peace and comfort and joy. And in the passage that we have for today, it's not a lengthy passage. There is drama here, but it's not controversial drama. You know, I always, I always uh, joke with Pastor Norman, and I told him that when, you know, when our family first arrived here, um, and we began to go to the other church, I won't mention it, um, but when we were there, you know, we, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark is what the book we were going through, and, and, and so they asked me, Pastor Ray and Pastor Norman asked me to preach, and I would start preaching, and every sermon Every passage they gave me was always Jesus confronting the religious leaders. It was like negative stuff, you know. And I'm like, what's going on? And, um, but it's, it's there, you know. Now, but this passage is different. This passage is different. It's, it's actually um, a passage that's kind of up, it's very uplifting. And when you read it, you think, okay, we got all this drama. We got persecution, persecution, reaction to that. And then we got Paul, or Saul, he's, he's wanting to kill the Christians, kill the Christians. And then conversion, and like, okay, the next thing you would expect is, Paul, go out there and let's do the work. But before Luke, as under the inspiration of the Spirit, writing this book, before he really deals with the Apostle Paul, he wants to highlight something else. And it's needed. You have to remember at the very beginning of the book of Acts. The very beginning. It said there. That the gospel would. Your ministry. The, the, the church growing. Would start in Jerusalem. And go out. Samaria. Uttermost parts of the earth. Right? That the gospel was going to spread beyond just the. Just the historical boundaries of, of Jerusalem. And even just, Jeru just Jerusalem itself and, and the nation of Israel. It was going to go beyond that. And it will. Through God working through the Apostle Paul. And then others. But what you see today in this passage is the focus goes back to the Apostle Peter. And it starts in at the, this passage that we have for today, and it keeps going into chapter 10. And it's that God is going to work and save people and change the lives of people who don't live in Jerusalem. And not all of them are Jews. You're going to see how the transition begins. Where the gospel is going to places outside of Jerusalem. Beyond the, the realm of that city. And how people will come to faith in Christ. And how some of them will even be Gentiles. There's a guy named Cornelius. You'll meet him in chapter 10. He's not Jewish. He's Roman. He's a Gentile living in a Jewish land. And how Peter, how God leads Peter to, to be with him and, 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 and explain the gospel to him and how his life has changed. So this is the plan of the book of Acts. Is that the gospel goes wherever God wants it to go. i never forget one of my mission trips here. Before we moved. I, I arrive in the Philippines, okay. I have no idea what this country's like. Never been here in my life. Again, the only thing I knew about the Philippines is that the, fl the roads are flooded year-round. Based on the news reports, that's all I knew. And I didn't know any of the, the Filipino stars and, and, and Filipino stuff. I, I had eaten a little bit of Filipino food before, but again, I didn't know anything. So I arrive, and I come on these mission trips, you know. And we go to different parts. Uh, uh, I go to different parts of the Philippines. And I remember on one trip, um, Pastor Sean Ransom, I was, I was staying with him, and he said, we're going to do ministry in a place called Barakai. Okay, well, whatever. I had never heard of that place. 
And, um, and so we're flying on Cebu Pacific Airlines, I think, or one of the airlines, and we're flying in, and I'm looking out the window, and I'm, you know, I didn't know, it's like, you know, I, 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 boy, that's a beach, you know, this is resortville, you know, and, and so I said, what are we doing here? He said, I, his, this was his words, I go where the, where the gospel sends me. <laughs> yeah, well, the gospel's sending you to a neat place right now, man. <laughs> so, you know, and then, I mean, we had pastors that we trained there for a week, and, you know, I, I was different. Training pastors in the day and then going out to the beach to eat dinner, you know. I'm like, like, this is weird. But wherever the God leads you to go to, to proclaim the gospel, he, he opens doors, he opens opportunities, and now you see Peter... Giving opportunities, being given opportunities to, to, to work for Christ. It's a very interesting passage, a very simple passage. Uh, but before I read that, let me start at verse 31. Let me just kind of go back. Um, our passage is really starting in verse 32 through 40, 43. But I want to give it a preface with verse 31. This was after the events of, of, of Paul's transformation, Saul's transformation, becoming Paul and being converted. And it says here, and this is very important, this, this verse 31 actually sets up what happens starting in verse 32, even through chapter 10. And, it, and so you just need to know this. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, you have to know those locations. Judea, Galilee and Samaria, that would be what we would call the nation of Israel at that time. Galilee is in the north. Remember Jesus would minister in Galilee. Judea is in the south. So Jerusalem is in the region. Just think of it like a province. Ju Jerusalem is in the province, the region of Judea. Uh, Capernaum, Nazareth, um, the Sea of Galilee. That's all in the province or the region of Galilee, which is in the north. In between the two is a place called Samaria. And that's where... You know, Jesus went through Samaria, right? Most Jews would go around it because they didn't like the people in Samaria. We're, we're not the first generation to have racial problems, okay? It's been going on since Adam and Eve. But anyway, so when he says Judea, Galilee, Samaria, that's a large mass. That's a large area of population, a geography. And, it's, and what's saying is the church that was in those places had peace, meaning the absence of persecution. With Paul being transformed and converted, he became the ring leader, right? He was the ring leader. He was the head guy leading the charge of persecution. And since he had been converted, it all ended just right then. And, and, and you say, well, what's, what's the point of that? The point is that God is allowing the church to have a peaceful time right now. You can actually walk outside your house and not worry about your head getting chopped off or being taken somewhere, arrested. You, there's, a, there's a freedom that's being allowed. There's a peace. And so the church was being built up, meaning that the Christians were growing in their faith. They are learning the word of God. They're, they're able to freely attend Bible studies or fellowship and, 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 and do what needed to be done. You're not fearing for your life. Now, maybe tomorrow it changes, but, you know, today. And it says they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The church multiplied. So the gospel is going forth. They're making most of the opportunities that God has given them. That's what this verse is saying. You just have to understand this is the, this is the normal, this is what's going on. Um, this is what was happening. They're walking in the fear of the Lord. It doesn't mean they fear God in the sense that God's going to kill me. No, it's reverence for God. So they, they have a heart of worship. That's the idea of fear of God. Reverence, worship, and then the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that the, the Holy Spirit lay, allowed them to lay on a comfortable bed, okay? When we talk about comfort of the Holy Spirit, it means that, that um, they had a worshipful attitude, 
a, a, a reverent spirit towards God, and it brought joy and peace to their soul at the same time. They didn't have to fear, you know, being taken and arrested. They had freedom. They were able to go do ministry. They could walk around, didn't have to hide and hide behind a, you know, feel like they're a spy or feel, you know, they were able to do what they needed to do and freely be able to minister. Now, why is this important? It's because God gave it to them, this rest and this peace, So, because God sovereignly wanted to do something. God can grow the church in the midst of persecution. He can grow the church when there's no persecution. God is not limited by circumstances. You and I are. We react differently to different circumstances. If nobody's bothering us and everything's great, you know, you can, that, that affects how you make decisions. But if you're feeling heat or you're feeling the persecution or you're feeling stress because of a situation, that's going to affect how you make decisions. You're bound by it. You're bound by those different situational si things that happen. God is not. And God wants something to happen, and, and it's going to happen. And to allow that to happen, God has to orchestrate the events in human history to make it happen. What verse 31 tells you is that God is sovereign. It's another indication of the sovereignty of God, that God is orchestrating a series of events to allow the church to be at peace with political leaders, religious leaders, you name it. And, and they don't have this fear of persecution doesn't mean this is going to last forever doesn't mean it's going to be like this way forever but for right now at this period of time and so the the things that happen in at this chapter in chapter 9 especially chapter 10 it, it, it's it happens under this framework okay it happens under this situational uh, time that God has allowed for peace now let me read to you the verses, uh, verse 32, through the end of the chapter, and then we'll begin looking at those. Now, now within that midst of that situation, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydia. There he found a man named Aeneas, or Aeneas, Aeneas. He was bedridden for eight years. He was paralyzed. He was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Verse 36. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill, she died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside, knelt down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. You would read a passage like this and say, okay, two things happen. One person is healed. The other one is brought back to life. And maybe at this point in the book of Acts, after you've read some Gospels, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect you too much because you know that Jesus healed many people. He even rose people from the dead and even gave that ability to the disciples. 
so that they could do that when needed, when, when, when the time was needed, and this is one of those occasions. So on the, when you read this story, it sounds like a very, very simple story, and it is. One is healed, the other one's raised from the dead, and, and um, we know God's working. Great, praise the Lord. You ready to close in prayer? Huh. Okay, I'll keep talking a little bit more. Um, but you read that and, it, and you go, praise the Lord, two people, one person healed, one person raised from the dead, and you ask yourself, how does that connect with the book of Acts? Notice each of the two accounts. Notice, notice each of them. The important part here is not the healing and the raising from the dead. Even though that receives the attention, most of the attention, this is not a passage that tells you that, oh, by the way, Peter could heal people and Peter could raise people from the dead. That's not the point of the passage. Even though these things happen, there's a, there's a greater point here. There's a greater issue. The reason this passage is included, remember, the church was having freedom. They were able to go about and do what they needed to do to serve the Lord. That means Peter is able to walk around anywhere in the nation of Israel right now and not feel the pressure of being arrested. The phrase that comes up after each, after the healing and after the resurrection, it's what, it's what drives this passage. If you look at, the, at verse 35, the final phrase there, they turned to the Lord. That's the key phrase. The gospel changed the lives of people that day. People came to know the Lord in a salvific way. Their life was changed. Just like the Apostle Paul, just like Saul's life was changed, their life was changed. We don't know a lot of the drama that took place in the midst of all that, but their life was changed. If you go down to the end of the next section in, the pas in this passage... Um, verse 42, it became known throughout all Joppa and many, what? Believed in the Lord. What, it's the result of what happens that's the key here. That's why this passage is in here. To show us that God is working through people to, 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 have to, to, so that the gospel will go forth and people will be saved. God doesn't need you or I. He doesn't need Peter to save anyone. But God uses Peter and uses us for his glory so that people see who God really is, who Christ really is, and their lives are changed and converted. That's what you see. And the interesting part is where are these people located? The cities of Joppa is not in Jerusalem. Okay? Joppa is not in Jerusalem. Um, the places of Lydda, Lydia and Sharon, not Jerusalem. So these are events that are taking place to show us, to give us another view, understanding of the big picture, that God is saving people outside of the city of Jerusalem, geographically speaking. That God can save people there, God can save people anywhere. God will save. God can save people here in the Philippines, in America, in Korea, anywhere. Anywhere in the world, Russia. China, he can save, it, save people anywhere. And that's what you see here. It's a beautiful picture of a healing and a miracle, of, of, of resurrection. It's a wonderful picture of that. It even makes it sound familiar like Jesus' time when he, rode, when he performed a resurrection. On a little girl, right? Remember that? Leader of the synagogue. It's a very similar story. But the point of the whole thing is that God does what he sovereignly has, what he wants to do to make sure 
that the gospel goes forth. Now, the key question you may ask, though, is what is the, since if that's the key issue, people believing in the Lord, <coughs> what is the connection to that, to the miracles? What is the connection to, to uh, people believing and the healing and the resurrection? Because do you have to have a healing and a resurrection for people to come to know Christ? No, you don't need that. Contrary to what some people teach, some denominations and some groups, you don't need a miracle to happen like that, a physical miracle to be convinced that God is real. Actually, it can be counterproductive. There are groups that teach you need your personal miracle. Right? And they, they teach that they, they can give you, come on, just come up here and I will slay you in the spirit. Woo! And you will receive your healing. And they, and they promote that kind of theology. And they even will base it on the book of Acts. It happened in the book of Acts. If it happened in the book of Acts, it has to happen here. Okay. If you want to claim that theology, if that's your rule of thumb, you can. If you're going to say, it happened in the book of Acts. They spoke in tongues. We can do it today. They, there was healings. We can do it today. If you're going to claim the book of Acts, you have to claim the whole book of Acts. Okay? Don't miss a beat. So, let's put it to the test on two other things. You should be able to be on the fourth floor of a building... Fall down and not die. Try that one. Let's see if it works. Number two. If you really think that Acts is normative. That everything in the book of Acts. We can have it today. Praise God. Then I would challenge you to go and get bit by a snake. And see how that works. There are people who actually do that. They handle snakes you know. They're kind of off in the head, but they believe that stuff. They take it to that extreme. You just try it. You see, everybody, what's the problem with these groups is that they want to make acts normative for every single thing or, you know, for miracles and healings. Why? Because it helps them accomplish their goals, which is getting people to come to them and people to come into their church and people to maybe even contribute to their ministry and, and they make money off of people. Just because there were healings in the book of Acts, miracles in the book of Acts, does not mean that it's normative for today. Does it mean God can't supernaturally work? No, he can do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to. But it doesn't mean God is bound by your version or your beliefs that he has to perform your miracle. And just because they may say, claim your miracle, sounds good. They're the... They're, they are leading you down the path. They're the con man, okay? It's a con job. It's no different than a pyramid scheme. It's, 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 it's like making a bad investment into a company that doesn't really, it's a, you know, doesn't really exist. They're out to take your... The, they may not be wanting your money as much. Some most do. What they want is influence over you. You gotta be careful. Acts is not that. Just because Peter could heal and, and and Peter rose people from the dead doesn't mean Peter had the ability. God's definitely working through him, but it doesn't mean that's normative. You say, well, in preaching the gospel, that's in the book of Acts. Yes, don't we do that today? Yes, but just because, it, but that doesn't mean it's normative. What is that? What am I saying by that? Yes, we preach the gospel, but when I preach the gospel, I don't think three thousand people come to Christ every time I preach. I can't expect that. When Peter preached, he had people coming to Christ. I could say, Acts is normative. So whenever I preach, 3,000 people come to Christ. We don't get that many YouTube views. I can't claim that. You know? As long as I have more than Pastor Norman, I'm okay. But we don't get that many, right? No. Just joking. But, you know, so act, even though, yes, we preach the gospel. Why, you know why we preach the gospel? Because it's commanded in the epistles to do that. 
You get to see an illustration of that in the book of Acts. There's nowhere in the, in the Bible where it tells you, go and heal someone. Claim your miracle. You're never told in the Bible that you explicitly have the power to heal someone. That, that, that don't. These preachers who say, oh, God has given me special power. They don't have that. It's a, it, it, they are leading you astray. But the question is, for this passage, is what is the connection between the miracle and the healing being done and belief in Christ and the miracle? Because there is a connection. It is, the connection is not that that's normative for today. That is not the point of this. That if you, you know what, if you were able to heal people, ask this question. If you had the ability to heal anybody that you touched, as some of these healers, faith healers say they have, right? Where would you go to do that? I go to the hospital, right? So instead of setting up a tent or a building and getting everybody to come in and pay their money, you just go to the hospital, wouldn't you? Clean it out. You saw, you'd hit the ICU. That'd be the first place I'd go. I'd hit the ICU. Tell me the person who's about ready to die. Go in there and heal them, you know? And let's hit the next one. Let's get the next one. Let's go to the next room. I'd have the hospitals cleaned down in a day. And I would do wherever I could to go to every hospital I could. And I'd do it every day if I had to. Hopefully somebody at least gives me a little bit of Pondesol so I can keep living. So I can keep healing. If you really had that ability... I think that's what we would do. Why? Because the love of Christ in our heart would compel us to do that. Peter is given the ability to heal and raise somebody from the dead. And there's a connection to that and people believing in Christ. The connection is not that it's normative for today and claim your miracle power. There's a different point to that. And as we walk through the text, you're going to see this. You're going to see, you're going to see what, what happens here. Let's look at the first account. Now as Peter went here and there. So he's traveling around. And he's traveling around them all. Meaning the, the believers. The, all is anywhere in Israel. Galilee, Samaria. Now Peter's willing to go through Samaria. Interesting, huh? Samaria and, and, and um, even Judea. So he's going through all those regions. He came down also to the saints who live at Lydia. That means that there are believers in Lydia already. Peter's not planting a church here. These are believers that are already there. We don't know how many. We don't know how big the congregation may be. Um, but there are Christians there. Maybe few. Now you say, where is Lydia? If you look at a map, I think the name of the city has changed today. But, it's, it's, but back then, if you go... Find Jerusalem. It's nowhere near Jerusalem. You got to go to the coast, okay? And you got to go to the coast. You've heard of the city Tel Aviv in Israel, right? Tel Aviv. Okay, it's on the coast. You come into the coast from the coast. I don't know how many kilometers, but you come in from the coast. Let's say this is the coast right here. Uh, we'll do it this way. Here's the coast. You come in. Jerusalem's like right down here. You come in. A little ways, and you're going to find it. Lydia, and there's a nearby region called Sharon. I don't know if it's on the maps in your Bibles, but this is what I found looking at. Googled it. I just Googled it. Okay? Um, so it's outside of Jerusalem, but still within the nation of Israel. When he goes there, I don't know what led him there. I don't know if there was something that happened. We just don't know about all that we don't. That's not the important point. The important point is that he showed up there. He arrived there. He found a man there named Aeneas. Aeneas. The guy was bedridden for eight years. He's paralyzed. He can't move. We don't know what caused the, uh, the paralysis. We don't know what, what caused it, what happened to him, what made... You know, it, 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 he, he's a man, and it's been going on for eight years, 
So maybe he could have been born with something and it finally got to the point where he's bedridden. No matter what caused it, what led to the problem, the health issue, that's not the situation. That's not the worry. That's not the important thing. It's that he's paralyzed. He can't move. He can't walk. He can't move. And he literally has to stay in bed. I mean, he doesn't get out of the house. You've, you may have known people like this, right? Would you want to be in that situation? Nobody would want that. So this guy is in a desperate situation, physically. How Peter finds him, we have no idea. Maybe someone knew about him, told Peter about it. Maybe he's just walking down the street and hears crying or something. I don't know. We don't have any idea. All those little details to all the story is not the important point. That's why they're not included. We can't make a movie out of this, okay? The point is... There's a simple thing being said here. So he's paralyzed. Peter says to him, Uh-oh, food's on this way. I gotta, gotta get to this quick. Huh? So Peter says to him, Now, far as we know, the man never says anything to Peter. He probably did, but if he did, it's not recorded. Again, it's not the important thing. But Peter speaks to him and, and dresses him by name and says, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. Just like that. <laughs> You've been laying in this bed for eight years. Why don't you get up and make it? You know? You don't have to lie in it any longer. And it says, just as those miracles that Jesus did, and the miracles that happened, the healings that happened in the early part of the book of Acts, immediately he arose. He got up. You know how we have the movies, you know, and it's like, you know, they make it, you know, like starting to, you know, weird stuff happening to, so they have to dramatize it, okay? Remember, they have to make a two-hour movie, so they have to make sure that's at least ten minutes of the drama. So, you know, it's got to be action and it's got to be the music, you know, going, there's no drama here, it's just, boom, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's a miracle, but he just rises up and, walk, and, and makes his bed, boom. Immediately he arose. You say, wow. Then you go to verse 35. And but see, all the residents of Lydia and Sharon, nearby, nearby place, they see this guy. They... Must, he may have been famous for some reason. I mean, everybody knew about him. They see this guy walking around. Healed. You were in bed for eight years. You're paralyzed. If we lift up your leg, come right back down. I mean, well, you can walk. You know, we could try to do, per, you know, let's get, let's, get you in the, let's get these trainers to come get you, you know, therapists. You know, we've, we sent 20 therapists. Mm. Who healed you? What happened? And notice what Peter said to the man. Jesus Christ heals you. So all the man knew. The man may not have even known, maybe not even known Peter's name. I don't know. But what he, what, what's staying in his head is that Jesus Christ healed me. All the glory goes back to Christ. And God uses the, that man being healed as a testimony of his grace and goodness to physically heal him. And, and as people saw him, him is not Peter. Him is the man healed. They turned to the Lord. There could have been... They could have said, this man came and said, Jesus Christ heals me. And, and, and maybe Peter preached. We don't have those details. But the point here is not how the gospel got to them except this. God showed them, showed all these people, that his power can bring salvation. His power can heal. 
But you know what's more important than the healing? You know this man eventually died, right? Yeah, he could walk, but he eventually died. His body gave out. At some point, he was laying back down again. He didn't live forever, not physically. But the point that Luke's trying to make is that the power of God changes, can change the life physically, yeah. But the power of God can change a life spiritually. They, these people saw, when they saw that man, what they saw is the power of God working. And that was the, that's the testimony. And the power of God saves everyone. People are only saved. You can only be saved by the power of God. But you don't need a miracle to make that point. That was what happened here. You can read the scriptures and you understand the power of God. But God wanted to communicate that point to those people. To that man and those people. The emphasis here is that I'm healed. Rise and make your bed. You're able to have ability to do things. Power has been restored to you through the power of God. And they saw that. Now the second one is this. Again, this is a very simple story. Verse 36. Now there was in Joppa. Joppa is actually on the coast. Wasn't it? Wasn't that, where, that was where Jonah was, right? Now there was in Joppa, so he's, there, now he goes to the seacoast. Now he, again, I, I didn't measure the kilometers from one to the other, but there was in Joppa, there's a disciple, her name's Tabitha, which if you translate it into another language, it's Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Her life had been changed, she's a disciple. She loves the Lord, and, and, and her heart is, she, she's not a preacher, okay? But she was, she was full of good works, acts of charity. She wanted to help people. That was, that was what she could do. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? So in those days, she became ill and died. She came down with some fever, some, something that caused her to die. I mean, the people I would assume are sad. I don't know how much family she had, or again, a lot of details are not given to us. But she dies, so she's physically, she's dead. And so they, the people prepared her for her burial. I mean, they were getting going to do all through the normal process, so they washed her body, and they laid her in an upper room. But instead of putting her into, into a sepulcher and a grave and all that, um, but since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples, they heard that Peter was there. They thought, maybe, maybe, maybe. So they urged Peter to come. Please come to us without delay. As far as we know, the way the text reads, she had already died before they reached out to Peter. Now, these people are probably looking for something. They're hoping for something. They're probably hoping for a resurrection. They got, they got a ground. They have, a, they have something to think about because Jesus rose people from the dead. If that doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, but they can hope for it. They didn't put her in a grave. They didn't put her in the sepulcher. They put her in an upper room, got her body cleaned and everything. Did everything they could do. Peter comes without delay. He rose and he went to them. He arrives. They take him to the place where the woman is, where the body is in the upper room. Now the widows, maybe, maybe Tabitha Dorcas was a widow herself, I don't know. But the widows that were in that group, um, these are women who had lost, you know, whose husbands had passed away. They were weeping, showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. They were, they were showing Peter this is what she had done. And, and um, not that that, you know, in one sense, I didn't. They were just showing, they were, they were, it was like she was a treasured person in their, in their church, in their life, and they were sad to lose her. And they're, they're trying to say, Peter, this is what she would do for us. Man, she, 
And I think in the back of their mind, I'm reading, I'm, uh, I'm making an assumption here. I think they're thinking, is God really, is, is her life over? Doesn't God still have something for her? And they're just hoping. And they're just praying. But in reality, it didn't matter. They don't have to convince Peter of anything. Peter sends them all out of the room. He sends them all out of the room. He puts them all out, not because he's out and angry with them or upset with them. It's nothing like that. He, what he's about to do needs to happen in a private situation. Private, okay? Not public. So everybody's gone. The door is shut. And he kneels down and he prays. He turns to the body. And he says to her, Tabitha, arise. He uses her name, the not translated version of it. Tabitha, arise. She opens her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand, raised her up. Resurrection. Clearly a resurrection. Just like when Jesus raised that little girl. He calls the saints and the widows and presents her alive. And if you wanted to see a jaw-dropping moment, there it is. They're probably like, they probably can't believe it. They were hopeful. I think that's what they wanted. But to actually see it happen? Like, you know, that rocks your world to see something like that. It's one thing to heal somebody before they die. It's another thing to raise them back up after they've died. Now, did Tabitha live forever? No. Eventually she would grow older and die. And nobody there to resurrect her. But for that day, God allowed her to be raised up and given life again, physical life. Now, here's the connection, verse 42. It became known throughout all Joppa. Again, the testimony of what happened spread. People heard about uh, Tabitha rising again. And many believed in the Lord. And here, in a sense, both, I, I've divided these to talk about the power of God can bring salvation and the words of God can bring salvation. Actually, both of those ideas are in each account. But I'm, I'm touching on the words of Christ here. The words of God can bring salvation because it's, it's interesting. He addresses Tabitha. He doesn't say Jesus Christ heals you or Jesus Christ resurrects you. He doesn't mention that. Not that he had to. But he just says this simple phrase. Tabitha, arise. In that there's power in the words there. As there's powers in the word, power in the words that <coughs> was spoken to the man who was bedridden. And see, many believed in the Lord. Something, I mean, two amazing things happen. Miracle and a healing. Or a healing and a miracle of resurrection. Two amazing things happen. But it's not about that. It's about the result of that. And how God used that to, to save people, to bring people to know the Lord. The church in Joppa grew that day. <coughs> the church in Lydda and Sharon grew that day. And then you have verse 43. He stays there for so many days, so he doesn't leave. He's around. And maybe he's doing more preaching and exhorting. And he's staying with a guy named Simon who's a tanner. He's got a job and he's found a room. And that's just you know, being lodged by a friend. But the point is, is Peter's not the, it's not Peter's ability that's on showcase here. Peter is just the instrument in God's hand. To see the power of God and the word of God work through him and bring healing and salvation. Not everybody who's believing in the Lord on the, and those two locations are receiving their personal miracle. Okay? Just because you're a Christian doesn't give you the right to say, God, come on, I want my personal miracle. 
right now. Come here. Give it to me. No. That's not the point of this. The point is that God in his grace saves people from their sins. And God is working sovereignly. And, and the point, if you want to think about Peter, God is just using him. As he, you don't, as he would use you. You may not have Peter. You may not have the same abilities that God gave Peter. God didn't give you the power to heal. Don't worry about it. Don't put yourself down by that. You may not be the most eloquent speaker. I'll tell you something. There are people who write books about the gospel, right? They write books and print books. And, and books can be a media, a way which people can read. Maybe people read a book and not watch a TV or, what, or go to hear a preacher at a church. People write books. There are people who do, do internet blogs. And there's people who do this. The gospel goes out in many different ways. And God equips his people to do that. But I'll tell you, you don't want me to write you a book. I hate it. I hate writing. I actually do. Can't stand it. You know, every week I, when I preach, I have to put one of these together, right? These... I do that because I know it's, well, if I don't, Pastor Norman will text me on Thursday and he will ask me, where is that? But it, if I didn't have to do that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even do that. It's just because writing is not my forte. Does it mean I don't write anything? No, I, I do what I have to do. But that's not my great ability. But God has equipped all of us in different ways and given us abilities and, 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 and opportunities of ministry. Your opportunity of ministry may not be what my opportunity of ministry is. Your, your world of influence and the people around you are not the same world that I walk in. And that's okay. God has us where he wants us to work and do for him. And he will work through us to accomplish the work that he would have to be done through, that he would have us to be a part of. And that's, that's okay. We're not all the ear, you know. We're not all the same part of the body of Christ. Paul makes that point in, 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 in regards to spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. But what you see here is an illustration, another story, another true story about how God used a man named Peter to accomplish his will using that man to see people come to Christ. Now, the next story in, about Cornelius, there's a lot more drama because it's one thing for Peter. Next, the next story, Peter gets a little bit more involved in it because these people were of the same nationality. Wait till he has to go and to Cornelius' house. Peter has a problem. You know what it is? He doesn't care for Romans, especially Roman soldiers. They are unclean. And Peter has to learn a valuable lesson. And what God is telling Peter is, Peter, I sent you to Lydia, right? I sent you to Joppa. Now I'm going to send you to a Roman centurion's house. Oh, great. See, with God's sovereignty, you can't decide where you go. If you had met me, Seven, eight years ago and said, you will be in the Philippines? I'd say, no way, Jose. I had never had any plan to come here. Not that I was against it. I had no plans. I was going to live in America and pastor a church. That's just where I thought I'd be. And my wife said, we're going to the mission field. I said, well, let's see. I wasn't totally convinced that I was supposed to be on the mission field. But you know what? God orchestrated it. And you know what? We've been here and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Actually, I enjoy living here better in America. It's less stressful. Yeah, you got traffic, you got heat, but it's less stressful. Man, everybody in America. Oh, my goodness. Everybody's a victim. There's so much controversy. It's unbelievable. But no. But God has people ministering there. If God wanted me ministering there, I'd go there. God has us here. God has you here. God has us all together. And so what we do is we, 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 we be led by the Lord, follow his leading, 
and, and go where he tells us to go. Do that which he calls us to do because he's equipped us. And we serve the Lord with joy and experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit while at the same time reverencing him, fearing him. That's what motivates us and drives us and keeps us going to do that which he's called us to do. And that's what the book of Acts is about, to give us understanding of how God will work through, through each of us to accomplish his will. And um, so that's the joy of it all. Let's pray. Lord, we do give you thanks for today. We give you thanks for all that you show us. How you work through the Peter in, in, in providing healing and, and a miracle of resurrection. But Lord, how you used all of that to display your glory, your power, the power of your words so that people could see you and come to you in saving faith. Lord, what a blessing. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.